Thank you so much for the invitation. And it's really uh, just a, a wonderful experience to get to come and um, hear all this exciting developmental biology. And um, then to share with you my uh, approaches to thinking about animal development and the important roles that resident microorganisms play in these developmental processes. So what you're looking at here is a, a live imaging of bacteria inside the intestine of a larval zebrafish. And you can, I think, appreciate that this is a really dynamic cell population that's integral to the animal. And, um, and uh, we're, we're very interested in how these communities assemble and then how they're influencing the biology of the host in which uh, they reside. So uh, today uh, I'm going to be telling you, you know, how we're thinking about how microbes influence development of animals. And I want to pose some general questions and then give you some examples of how we're uh, approaching these questions. So one question is really, you know, to what extent do uh, associated resident microorganisms influence the development of animals? And that's something that we'll be exploring in the zebrafish model. And then um, if they do impact uh, animal development, then it, you know, I think a very fundamental question that is fascinating to developmental biologists is what are the natures of the signals that um, can direct animal development that are produced by, by microorganisms? Um, and then finally, um, uh, I'd like to end with uh, some thoughts about the implications of uh, the impact of, uh, on development by microorganisms. Uh, you know, how, how can uh, events uh, that impact early development uh, have long-term consequences in the life uh, time and the, the health and well-being of the organism? So uh, I'll be telling you today about our work with the zebrafish, which has, of course, uh, been a wonderful model system for developmental biology. And so many of the traits that make it such a great developmental system also really make it um, a great system for looking at host microbe interactions. So um, you know, one thing that, that we take advantage of is the fact that these are rapidly developing animals, so we can do um, very uh, rapid experimentation. And they're optically transparent, and that gives us this incredible access to looking at these dynamic interactions between resident microbes and their hosts um, within a living animal. Uh, we also um, very much appreciate the fact that these are genetically tractable organisms and we can do large scale studies. And I think that's been really an important feature for um, studying host microbe systems, which often uh, the kinds of interactions that we see are, are more variable um, between individuals within a population. So we really need to look at large population sizes uh, to make inferences about these relationships. And finally, something that's, uh, that's been very um, powerful um, that my lab has, has uh, worked on extensively is developing tools to manipulate the associations of zebrafish with their resident uh, microorganisms. And so that's the field of notobiology where all of the, the living components of a system are known. And that involves um, both being able to derive animals under sterile or germ-free conditions, and then also manipulate associations um, with natural residents of, of, um, of the uh, animals. So to give you just a little bit of a, a um, time scale of, of, of um, the zebrafish early development and the periods we're looking at, um, so the animals uh, develop initially uh, it is um, embryos in a, uh, essentially sterile chorion. There are a few um, um, pathogens that can penetrate that, but in, in general laboratory conditions, these are sterile animals. And they'll hatch out of these sterile chorion between two and three days after fertilization. And that's when they first encounter microbes within the, in, um, their environment. And um, uh, then uh, initially at three days, their, their mouth is open by four days, they have a completely continuous gut tube. And so now, you know, the whole interior of the animal is, is open to the microbial world. And by five days, we can see a robust uh, gut microbial community assembled within the lumen of, of the gut. And then when we think about well, what's happening to the development of the animal in this, this time, so there's a lot of important morphogenesis that's happening in this sterile time period. Uh, but then uh, post uh, this hatching event, there's also very important maturation of uh, the intestinal tract. And um, 
And this is happening at the same time that there's also this association with, with environmental microbes. And so um, we've been very interested in asking how um, the presence of these microbes can influence developmental events that are happening in this time period. And um, the, a lot of what we think about is we compare the state of the animals with their normal uh, microbial community or the conventional state uh, to the germ-free state. And this is the, the, the way we're thinking about this is very similar to thinking about the genetic basis for development. So, you know, many times uh, uh, people will analyze the phenotype of a genetic mutant, and from that you can infer a particular requirement for that gene in a normal developmental process. And so and, uh, similarly, uh, we can infer uh, functions of the microbiota in development if, if we do, uh, identify a developmental deficit in the germ-free state compared to the conventional state. And so those kinds of studies have allowed us to make inferences about certain conserved responses of vertebrates to their microbiota. So these are um, uh, inferences we can make based on the germ-free phenotypes of both uh, zebrafish and, and mice that they're um, requirements for the microbiota in normal digestive tract physiology, cell uh, type specification, epithelial differentiation, immune cell recruitment, and cell proliferation, for example, within the, the digestive tract. And then another important thing that we can do is we can take these germ, this germ-free state and then add back particular um, uh, uh, microbes or microbial products. So for example, performing a mono-association with a normal resident of that community. And if we can then reverse a germ-free uh, phenotype, then we can make uh, an inference that that particular microbe is sufficient to, to uh, perform that, that developmental uh, function. And um, similarly, we can also use a logic that one would use in developmental genetics where we can ask, are there particular host uh, pathways um, that we can mutate and then make, now make the animals uh, insensitive to the presence of that microbe, that microbial signal. And so we can actually perform a sort of uh, genetic epistasis, but with, with a, a microbial partner in this, this kind of uh, way. And so these, from these sorts of studies, we've been able to identify particular functions of the microbiota in maturation of the, the gut. So for example, um, we looked at the expression of a classical marker of enterocyte maturation, intestinal alkaline phosphatase, which you can visualize with this purple staining here on the uh, apical surface of the gut lumen. Um, and there's much less of that enzymatic activity in a germ-free intestine. Uh, and um, we, could, we, um, we went on to show that um, there's a particular bacterial signal, the bacterial cell wall component lipopolysaccharide, which is a very common uh, component found in all gram-negative bacteria, that is sufficient to reverse the lack of this alkaline phosphatase activity. And interestingly, that enzyme um, in the host actually detoxifies LPS. So it's, it's this interesting feedback where the bacteria are upregulating an enzyme that makes the bacteria then less pro-inflammatory for the host. And that um, the host pathway that's perceiving that, uh, that signal is a, a common innate immune signaling pathway dependent on NMOD88, the common adapter for the toll-like receptor signals. So another um, germ-free trait that we've described is a paucity of secretory cells, shown here for these mucus-secreting goblet cells, which are, make up a, a smaller proportion of the total intestinal epithelium in the germ-free versus uh, the conventional state. Um, in this case, we don't know the specific factor, but we know that, sp that certain specific bacteria produce a secreted factor that will reverse that germ-free trait. And we know that it, it involves um, signaling through MITE88 and notch uh, signaling pathways that are um, uh, classical pathways determining cell fate specification in, in the epithelium. We've also shown that in the germ-free state, the renewal of the intestinal epithelium uh, is reduced. So there's, there are fewer proliferating cells uh, within the, the intestinal epithelium of germ-free versus conventional animals. Um, in this case, we've actually been able to identify a particular secreted protein made by certain bacterial members of the community uh, that's sufficient to, re to upregulate that cell proliferation. And um, that's working through MITE88 and WINT signaling pathways. So again, feeding into pathways that are well known to be involved in, in cell proliferation in, in the epithelium.
And finally, we, another trait we've looked a lot at is the associated immune cells within the intestine, uh, and in this case, the neutrophil cells, which are some of the first cells to come into in response to um, an infection. But also here, we, we've shown that just the normal homeostatic level of neutrophils in the intestine is dependent on the presence of a, a normal gut microbiota. So there are very few of these um, myeloid peroxidase positive neutrophils in the gut epithelium of a germ-free versus a conventional animal. In this case, um, a generic signals such as LPS are sufficient to induce uh, those, the uh, recruitment of these uh, uh, cells, but we've also shown that certain bacteria produce very specific secreted proteins that modulate the response of these neutrophils. And again, that these um, involve uh, MIDI-88 signaling and um, tumor necrosis factor uh, signaling pathways. So that gives you some flavor of some of the types of germ-free traits that we've started to dissect um, within the intestine. Um, but we've also, uh, I want to share with you a, a newer story that we, we've just recently published that has to do with um, a, a impact of the microbiota on another extra-intestinal organ, the pancreas. And this is work of a really talented graduate student, Jennifer Hampton. Um, and she was interested uh, in, you know, what happens um, to the development of another organ that's doing some interesting things in this, this time period um, post-hatching, and that's uh, the pancreas. So when uh, zebrafish larvae hatch around three days, they already have a fully functional pancreas with a population of insulin secreting beta cells, which are really critical for the animals to be able to modulate uh, their, their metabolism uh, as they're starting to swim around and, um, and look for food and ingest uh, exogenous food. In this time period between three days post-hatching and six days, there's a um, period of uh, intensive expansion of this beta cell population, so it almost doubles in size. And so that's happening concurrently with this colonization of the animals with, with a resident microbial community. So Jennifer looked and asked, is there an impact of microbes on, on pancreatic development? And indeed she found that in germ-free fish, there's a marked paucity of these insulin producing beta cells. Here we can visualize that with transgenic fish that express GFP under the insulin promoter. And so, um, as I told you, in, in conventional um, fish, there's this expansion of that beta cell population. And what she finds is that in the germ-free fish, um, that, that population fails to expand uh, in that same time period. And so then she asked, well, if she, uh, are there certain bacteria that are sufficient to reverse that paucity of beta cells? And what she found is that, indeed, when she performed these mono-associations uh, uh, of germ-free fish, there were certain bacterial isolates that we had isolated from the zebrafish gut, some Aramonas and a Shuanella strain, that were sufficient on their own to, re uh, to restore a normal number of beta cells, and then other uh, bacterial strains that, that um, failed to do that and looked similar to the germ-free trait. So then um, she went on to ask, are there um, bacterial products that are made that can reverse this trait? Um, and so she performed um, this, a simple fractionation, um, collecting the cell-free supernatant, so the secreted material um, isolated from cells that, that we um, spin down and filter out. And um, what she found is that indeed these Aramona strains all produced some kind of secreted factor in their cell-free supernatant um, that was sufficient to restore this paucity of beta cells, um, whereas this Vibrio strain that, that uh, on its own in a mono association didn't stimulate beta cell proliferation also didn't produce a secreted factor. And furthermore, she showed that if she treated um, one of these cell-free supernatants with protonase K, that destroyed the activity, suggesting that it was likely to be a protein. So she went on then um, and tested uh, an Aramonas mutant that we had in the lab. Uh, it was a, a generous gift from our colleague, Jorg Graf. Um, and this is a mutant that lacks uh, this, the standard um, type 2 secretion system that gram-negative bacteria use to, to secrete uh, many uh, 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 proteins. And so uh, these uh, organisms will have many fewer secreted proteins in their secretomes uh, compared to wild-type strains. And what she found is that, um, uh, remarkably, the, this mutant still produced whatever activity it was in the cell-free supernatant. So that was actually quite beneficial because it meant it reduced the complexity of the 
protein mixture that we were looking at. So she went on to do a little bit more fractionation and then actually just determined the identity of the protein composition of um, this secretome relative to the wild type. And then um, from there, she was able to perform a sort of bioinformatic um, fractionation where she asked of the um, identified proteins uh, in that material that had this activity, um, which were present in um, the genomes of the bacteria that had the capacity to induce beta cells, and then also absent from those that didn't have that activity. And using that kind of um, bioinformatic approach, uh, she uh, remarkably came up with a single protein that met that criteria from, from the mass spec analysis that we had uh, performed. Uh, this was a, a novel protein of unknown function. When she purified and uh, expressed and purified that protein and added it to our germ-free fish, she was able to restore the beta cell numbers. And that's shown here. Um, so uh, then we went on to name this protein beta cell expansion factor, or BEFA, for its capacity to uh, induce uh, beta cell expansion in these germ-free animals. Um, and so uh, we also wanted to know, is this the only factor that, that um, Aramonas is producing that has this capacity? So we, we went on to make a, a Befe mutant Aramonas. And indeed, um, when you mono-associate germ-free fish with a Befe mutant or use cell-free supernatant, um, they're, they're unable to um, restore beta cell numbers, and you can rescue that with purified Befe protein. So um, we were curious to ask, well, uh, where else would, might one find this, uh, you know, now that we had found this, this particular protein that had this activity, um, what other uh, bacteria make uh, this a similar type of, of, uh, of um, protein? And, um, and so if we, we looked, um, can look for Befe homologs in bacterial genomes, we found them um, in a number of different uh, marine organisms, some of these vibrios. Uh, I, I should emphasize this is not found in all strains of a particular bacterial species. So it's, it's really quite sparsely distributed across bacterial genomes that we looked at. Um, we saw one example where um, there was a clear event of a horizontal gene transfer of um, so a gene very similar to our Aramonas gene, uh, but to a human gut associated bacterium and Urococcus scallionum. And then if we expanded out our search to even more distant uh, homologs, we could find additional Befe-like uh, genes in um, some other gut-associated um, uh, bacteria from, from humans and, and mammals, including Escherichia, Klebsiella, and Enterobacter. And so Jennifer was curious to see, um, are these, these proteins that are found in these human gut-associated bacteria, do they still have this, this beta cell expansion activity? So she cloned and sequenced um, these two from Enterococcus and Enterobacter, um, and she showed that if she um, used those, uh, added those to our germ-free fish, that they um, were also uh, sufficient to restore this beta cell paucity. So this, this property that we're measuring is actually distributed across bacterial uh, genomes, including bacteria associated with humans. And so um, we're, we're very interested in understanding more about this protein function, and I should say we're, we're still, this is, uh, you know, an active area of, of research, and so now what I'm going to tell you is unpublished work. Um, this, this protein um, that we, we had, um, looked at, it had not previously been studied, but it has uh, within its C-terminal domain um, a domain that had been characterized in some other proteins uh, that are actually found from all kingdoms of life. Um, and it's this SYLF domain. And um, so uh, Jennifer teamed up with a postdoctoral fellow in the lab, Emily Goraswini, who's a really talented biochemist. And um, one of the things that had been described as a potential function for this SYLF domain was a lipid binding activity. So uh, Emily and Jennifer um, produced a purified protein of the um, Befe and, and assayed for lipid binding activity using um, some strips with, with different types of lipids spotted down. And so um, they've uh, identified this binding activity of uh, phosphatosylserine as a, a, a activity of, of this protein. And um, we still uh, don't know if this um, lipid binding activity has anything to do with the um, 
beta cell expansion factor, but it's an interesting clue as to a possible function for this protein. We are also um, really interested to know what this protein might look like at a structural level. And for that, we um, uh, turned to my colleague, Jim Remington, who's a really talented protein crystallographer. And working with Emily and Jennifer, they were able to produce um, protein crystals and uh, determine the, the crystal structure for, the, for Beth A. And uh, what's very exciting is that this protein actually has a, a completely novel protein fold. Um, it has uh, this, this uh, very uh, marked uh, kind of business end of the protein, this, this beta barrel, um, and then the, these alpha helices. And um, uh, you'll recall that I told you this, there's uh, this uh, domain within the protein, this SYLF domain, and that really constitutes this, this barrel structure here. Um, so you can see uh, this is just a schematic of what that SYLF domain uh, portion of the entire protein looks like, and that's the most conserved portion that's shared um, with these other more distant homologs. Um, so Jennifer asked, is that portion on its own sufficient to induce the beta cell expansion? And indeed, uh, it is. So this is really um, sort of the, the, the part of the protein that we're, we're very excited to, to continue to explore um, uh, functionally and try to understand how it might be, be uh, acting. So I, I just wanted to you know, conclude by saying that this uh, discovery of the, this protein you know, from, from this, the zebrafish system has then allowed us to step out and look at the spectrum of, of where these proteins are found. Um, and as I mentioned, they're also found within um, these, these human um, uh, gut-associated bacteria. And we think this is really thought-provoking because of the fact um, that uh, diseases with, uh, associated with, with a paucity of beta cells are, are an important disease in humans and um, have been linked to the microbiota. Um, and, and actually, um, it's interesting also that the, the maturation of this insulin-producing population um, in, in mammals, also there's an important postnatal period um, of expansion of, of these beta cells. So this is uh, data uh, from humans showing that um, in the first few months of life, there's this marked expansion of the beta cell population, and then um, the rate of cell proliferation of those cells um, goes down, and the, these are famously very quiescent cells. Um, and so this, this period of postnatal expansion is concurrent with a you know, really important period in um, early uh, human health and, in the, um, and development in, during the period when the uh, intestinal tract is first colonized and you, um, the, the associations with gut microbes are happening um, in, in the, the human life. So interestingly, um, in uh, examples of, of type 1 diabetes, those are uh, diseases of a paucity of beta cells. And um, there's been a lot of interest in, in uh, looking at associations between microbiota composition and risk for type 1 diabetes. And in uh, one uh, prospective longitudinal study um, of a, a cohort of children who were genetically predisposed to develop diabetes, they followed the composition of the gut microbiota of this, this cohort over time. And interestingly, um, saw a subset of the children actually had a marked loss of uh, microbial diversity within their microbiomes, which actually preceded the onset of um, disease which, uh, and, and seroconversion. Um, and so uh, this is uh, suggesting that there really could be some important roles of you know, microbiota in uh, um, uh, the development of this disease. And, um, and I think, uh, you know, it, it's thought-provoking to think about how um, uh, you can imagine, you know, our data is suggesting that um, associations with microbes early in development could impact the um, population size of the, the uh, beta cells. And then um, we know that type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease, and it's triggered by destruction of, of the beta cells. Um, and, and that um, autoimmunity could very well, is likely also impacted by the composition of the microbiota. Um, but we imagine that um, this early life history really can um, set up the risk for developing disease later. So if you have um, a paucity of beta cells that are, uh, are in early development, then you're going to be much more susceptible to this uh, autoimmune destruction and more likely to develop disease later. So um, in, in conclusion, I've, I've 
talk to you today about um, how resident microbes can influence developmental programs, uh, what kinds of uh, microbial products can do this, and what are the long-term consequences. I hope I've, I've been able to convince you that um, from our zebrafish model, we're learning that resident microbes have important roles in uh, the maturation of the digestive tract as well as, uh, as uh, tissues such as the pancreas. Um, and that we, uh, we can find examples of both generic mo molecules such as lipopolysaccharide, but also very specific secreted proteins such as BFA that can influence these uh, developmental programs. Um, and that, um, you know, I would contend that as, as we think about um, diseases associated with microbiome imbalance, that we really should be thinking about developmental origins for those diseases and, um, and whether, you know, early life history events um, that could influence development of tissues then can have long-term consequences uh, for, for health. So I'd like to just uh, uh, conclude by acknowledging uh, the people who've contributed to this work. Um, much of this work was the, um, that of uh, Jennifer Hampton, now Jennifer Hampton Hill, uh, she's just uh, getting married, um, as well as um, other uh, wonderful members of my lab, um, some former uh, members whose work I mentioned, uh, collaborators at the University of Oregon, and, uh, and uh, my collaborators also uh, at, at Harvard and funding sources, and I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you.